Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to begin our studies here um, this morning with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this past week and the things that we could learn that you have revealed to us that show that you are leading and guiding this movement. And uh, we are thankful for the time that we have here this morning. You lift this movement up in prayer. We know that um, you are showing us that uh, we have a responsibility to one another. And, um, and we just pray, Lord, that you can continue to lead and guide as we seek um, to be reconciled to you and to one another. Be with us now in this study. May your Holy Spirit be here to teach us. May we have open hearts and minds that we can be corrected by you and um, that we can learn more and more of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, well, before we started this meeting, we watched a little bit of a video that's on WhatsApp. And uh, that video uh, shows what's being done with the property, School of Prophets property that we talked about the last couple of days. And uh, I'm going to uh, draw out the charts that are behind me. So, um, you know, so behind me, there's these charts that we drew out the last couple of days. I'm drawing these out on PowerPoint so we have more clear uh, diagrams and also explanations of some of the, the things about the line of Judges chapter 9. So, uh, but we're continuing Judges chapter 10. And um, uh, we had addressed uh, in the first five verses this um, period of time that we believe that we're in. So the 23 years and the 22 years, they're just symbolic together of 45. So this is in this period with the... Uh, the Trump prediction that, that has failed and um, the type of spirit that we need in order to uh, move forward in this movement. But in Judges chapter 10, we have this new line and this line goes back. So uh, we had looked at these 18 years. So in Judges 10, 8, it says the year that they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel and that year, they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. All the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. So we took this as um, going back from, because we know one of the things that we're doing when we're looking at Judges, uh, because of Judges chapter 2, saying that this is from 9-11 to 2023. And so... This is going to recap that history with another story of oppression, but then it's going to bring us to the story of Jephthah. And, and we've looked at that before, but the point here is that this uh, vexation and oppression is 18 years. And um, what we did with that, 18 years as we counted from September 11th, 2001 to September 11th, 2019. And Jeff uh, did a presentation. Um, and that presentation was, it's called Locking the Doors. It's number five of his series uh, that he did uh, beginning on September 7th, 2019. And there he's going to talk about the closing of the doors of Lambert Church, which occurred on September 11th, 2019. So the significance there is that is a period of 18 years. Uh, any thoughts on that? Anybody have any thoughts about that 18 years? Is that, do we, 
do we take this as a type of oppression that has come? Um, and remember, there is uh, a 5-2 combination. There's seven different uh, gods, right? Balaam, Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, Zidon, Moab, Ammon, and the Philistines. So we have seven enemies or gods that are being worshipped, I guess, by the Israelites in a 2-5 combination. And this 18-year oppression. Uh, what comes to me about the 18-year oppression is when Christ healed a woman that was bowed down, I guess she had a very severe hunchback for 18 years. And that that was in the synagogue, if I recall correctly. So it's an oppression within the church, in my opinion. I could be wrong, but that's what I'm saying. Well, well, I would say that the, the oppression here would end up being, um, uh, because this is talking about this a movement, but it is it is these false gods, right? Yeah, well, I regard this this movement as a church. <laughs> yeah. So now the thing that that's interesting. So if we take eighteen years. And we take it as prophetic years, so that's 6,480 days. Uh, um, so 6,480 brings us to uh, June 9th, 2019. Now, I think we noticed this before. I think we had looked at this when we were looking at this 18 years before. Um, and the significance of the June 9th, 2019 date um, is that that's one year to the day um, after we had um, introduced time into the movement, right? So that's going to be from Jeff's 9-11 prayer, closing the Sabbath. Um, that's going to mark the start of June 10th. And that's going to be when Parminder presents the time setting. So that's in 2018. This is one year to the day from that date, right? So, <clears throat> um, so we can see here that we're going to be connected to these 18 years um, that are going to end with the closing of Lambert Church. But we also have uh, a symbol that ties us to this one year period which would be the last year of that 18 years in which um, we have this time setting. So whether that is, is significant, it's significant as a symbol. I don't know if we mark something on June 19th or June 9th, 2019. So this is um, Jeff that had actually uh, noticed the 18 years. Jefferson noticed the 18 years? No. I mean, he noticed September 11th. He didn't mark it as 18 years as such. But he, he was the one that noticed the, the sale was on September 11th. Well, wasn't this in sale? It was just they closed the door to, to, to Lambert Church. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Because there was this struggle going on uh, because uh, Parmenter's group wanted to uh, retain that church. They wanted to have services there and continue uh, controlling Lambert Church. But of course, they didn't own it. It was owned by Toby. So th they were forced to, to close the church. And they put it up for sale. I don't know when it sold, but it did sell just like the school sold. Okay. Would so you call this a doubling? Uh, a doubling in which way? Uh, Judges 10 8. Okay. 18. Okay. I, oh, I see what you're saying. So, yeah. So, the numbering there, the 18 years and uh, 10 8. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you have this doubling of this number. And, and the way that it's written in Hebrew, I think in this passage, um, so when you look at, uh, let's see how they do this. 
Yeah. So what they do is they take the word um, eight and ten, right? So in Hebrew, if you look at this here, um, you can see this uh, eight and ten, and of course, um, they they're going to put it this way they're going to go because i'm reading from right to left so that's going to be eight and then ten so but if you look at it here ten eight it's going to have ten and then eight because we write it backwards right i mean we read from left to right but if we read from right to left it's eight ten so it's not just that it's 18 it's eight and ten does that that make sense So if we were taking this English, Judges 10, 8, and we read it in Hebrew, we'd be reading 8 and 10. And that's the way that the, the Jews write it. They don't, they don't have a number for 18. They just write 8 and 10. So, so it's an interesting point there. So, so this um, oppression... Um, I believe that this movement has experienced it. And in what way would we say that the movement has experienced this oppression from the worship of these strange gods? This, this false worship. How has that infected the movement? And why is it marked as 18 years? Because, you know, we're Seventh-day Adventists, right? We, most of us have, have been Seventh-day, not everybody has been baptized into the Adventist church, but most of us have. And some of us still go to Adventist churches occasionally. Um, but um, we know that this movement came out of the Adventist church. Jeff was a Seventh-day Adventist. Many of the people who uh, were part of the movement, were Seventh-day Adventists. And many of them, after certain periods of time, uh, would return to the Adventist church. Some of them would go to the world, but often some of them would just go back to the church. So it depends where we came from and what our connection was with the church before we were in this movement. Is there false gods that people in this movement has, have worshipped and could we sort of specify what these are? What is what is the what is it that has infected Adventism that has infected this movement? Wanting to be like the world. Okay. So wanting to be like the world. And now what does that mean particularly? Well, I would say. You know, we want to say that we're separate of the world, but um, we try to use their ways of doing things in order to communicate with them right. and amongst ourselves even. Yeah. So we know with the, with the Adventist church, that's been one of their major characteristics from my perspective as an outsider Adventist. Yeah, so not wanting to offend people, but but really this is admiring the world and wanting the praise and admiration of the world and value, valuing the world's methods. And so we, we've seen so many things happen in Adventism from, uh, well, you can go back to um, even in the 60s, Adventist churches, um, the Adventist church, you know, had a radio station, I believe in California, you know, with rock music to try to attract young people um, all these different methods of evangelism that we have tried, that the world has tried, um, celebration, uh, different types of psychological text techniques like neurolinguistic programming, and of course, um, 
uh, spiritual formation, all these types of things that the church has tried to use rather than using the counsels given in the spirit of prophecy. And we want to have big institutions. We want to have fancy buildings. Um, uh, we want to have a show of things. And, and that's worldly, right? Those weren't Christ's methods. They weren't the methods used by, by our pioneers in giving this message to the world and by the early Adventist church. But we did see this type of thing creep in. I mean, and Ellen White warned against it. Battle Creek. Not just the sanitarium, but everything about Battle Creek. Creating this, uh, basically, um, I don't know what, you, what, what the word is it for, but a center for Adventists. So... And, and we see this with lots of our colleges um, and institutions. Uh, people gather around it basically for the loaves and the fishes rather than um, really the work that God has given us to do. And we want to do a big work. We're not satisfied with little things. We don't understand the power of little things. So, you know, if, if we can get 5,000 people baptized in a day in India, even if they're not going to stay in the church, that's seen as a wonderful thing, when in reality, all of the work that's being done for souls is being done on an individual basis, not by done, done by big evangelistic series. So, and Ellen White never um, wanted these big events, because that's not how you really win people. It's that personal influence in ministering for people. And when we did have evangelistic series, the idea is that this work had already been done. Uh, this would just be bringing an evangelist to do some organization, uh, present some meetings and, and have people often, but they would be uh, starting a church you know, because they had started with maybe just a couple of family going into a community and doing this work. So, so we see all these, um, worldly aspects now how it's affected the movement we know that uh, the movement has tried to do things in, in a big way believing that that's the way to do it um, and following worldly principles and policy rather than the principles set out in god's word and it's also affected us theologically so um the way that we decide you know, what truth and error is, having committees set up uh, to examine documents and decide whether something's true or not, that's not really God's way. And um, to control the message, the way that control has been exercised, and people still seek to have this idea of control, that somehow I can, since I'm the one in the know, um, I can decide who's going to be able to be heard or not heard. And I don't think that that's the way that, that Christ would work, um, especially when we have brothers who maybe just differ slightly on some points who want to study and we're not willing to study. So, um, But what we see more that happens if we're going to take these 18 years and we bring them to 2019, to September 11th, um, uh, we can see that this is marking the end of something in this movement, at least the beginning of the end, right? So one of the things we would see about that history um, is that we're still in that history that's connected with um, this period of reform. That is, we're in the history of Jephthah. So... Um, So we read over this, um, and I don't know what other things that we could, I'm sure if uh, we, we examine some of these things more closely, um, we might bring out some things that we, 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 we've missed, but this is just giving us a summary of this further disobedience and oppression. So it's not going to be after Tola and Jair that we would put this on a line, we're going to go back, right? So we're going to go back, and this is covering a period 
from September 11th, 2001 to September 11th, 2019. So I, I do want to move on to chapter 11. Um, is there any further thoughts that we should notice in chapter 10? I mean, we know who the enemies are. We're going to have uh, the Ammonites gather together. And they're going to camp in Gilead. And the children of Israel assemble themselves together and camp in Mizpah. And they're looking for a man to come and fight against the children of Ammon, some kind of leader, right? We covered this not long ago. And that's going to be Jephthah. Okay, but before before we jump back into chapter 11. Okay. Spirit of Prophecy had noted in the Signs of the Times of August 11th, 1881. Yeah. That, that to some extent during the latter part of Jair's reign and more generally after his death, the Israelites again relapsed into idolatry. Right. So we have this issue that even while Jair was alive, that the children of Israel had chosen to go into idolatry. And that's paragraph eight. Okay, so back here. Right. Now, we're not going to take this, though, and, and take this line and continue on from our, our time. We're going to go back to 2001, right? No, I, I follow that. Right. So, but yeah, so she's going to mention this idolatry, which the Bible is telling us about, but it, we know that we can, we can take this story. So the point is the story of Jephthah is in response specifically to the worship of idolatry, right? Okay. okay. And that even though we have these different lines, they're, they're telling us different things about our history. Right. So first we had these enemies, these external enemies. Right. These that were left in the land to test us. And, and so we address those in our history from 2001, what those were. Um, and then we, um, you know, as we kept going through this, we would see that we could zoom into a way mark on our lines. And we could see that each of the stories of the judges is referring to specific things. And of course, when it came to Gideon, chapter six, seven, and eight, where zooms into the particular dates on our seven, seven, seven structure. So November 9th and July 18th and December 21st. Um, and then uh, uh, when we deal with the Bimelech, it's going to deal with uh, events connected with the end of that structure as well, but coming up to our time. So up to the 2023. So now when we look at chapter 10, this is going to review this history, but specifically in the case of idolatry. That is, it's addressing each of these oppressions, each of these uh, uh, um, stories right, that, that we have. Um, we can see that there's a particular judge who's in response to that. And so God is correcting his people in this period of time um, from 2001 to 2023, which is this movement right now. That's how we're making this application. So, um, but, but different aspects are being addressed. That is, there's different enemies. And so each of these have to be dealt with. So now we're dealing with idolatry, but this is something internal, Right. So we have this problem of idolatry, but God is allowing this external enemy that's the children of Ammon um, that is bringing this oppression as a result of our idolatry. And so this movement is presently addressing this idolatry and has been since 2019, right? So we're going to have this idolatry, and then we have this message of Jephthah that rises up and ad addresses this specifically, right? That's the way we would look at it. 
Okay. I agree with the, the point that the idolatry is an internal situation. Mm -hmm. Then you have, like you were saying, the Ammonites, but also the Philistines. Yeah. Because as, as this had continued in the spirit of prophecy, the divine judgments followed close upon the transgressions of Israel. The Ammonites made war upon them in the east and the Philistines in the west. Yep. Other nations also united with these in oppression of Israel until they seemed again to be shut in by relentless foes. Now, the idolatry being the internal issue, mm -hmm. the Ammonites, the Philistines, and the other nations, the threefold enemy being the external issue. Right. So we're shown fairly clearly, again, the internal external situation that the movement has to face. Okay. Now, now when it comes to um, these different, I mean, and, and he's going to talk about, because um, remember we talked about how the, uh, the Lord said to the children of Israel, it doesn't give a specific prophet or judge or anything who says this. It's just going to be this um, God taking the work into his own hands, right? That's the way we would we would use this symbol. Right? So God has taken his this work into his own hands. And, and I would say that that begins in 2019 with what had happened after Parminder's group has split. And then Jeff uh, begins to um, speak against it. He, he wakes up and, and, and things happen in fast su succession, quick succession with, um, you know, the Lambert school or the Lambert church. And um, so here we have this situation where now, all this, all this stuff happens. July 18th is going to be, start being proclaimed. Um, lots of things happen from, from that time in September of 2019. So, so when we, so when we deal with this, this enemy that has been infecting this movement, this idolatry, it's not settled in 2019. This is God now giving them a message, giving us a message. And that message um, is initially going to be the July 18th prediction. Right. That is, that's what happens. And, and one of the things that that's attached to it. So when we, we count 18 literal years, that brings us to September 11th, 2019, when Lambert church is closed. So that becomes a symbol if we took 18 prophetic years, that's going to bring us to June 9th, 2019, one year to the day where we mark the beginning of time setting in this movement. So that becomes significant as well. So we can see that this 18 years ends with a message based upon time, right? Specifically, the time is not the the November 9th date, even though that that because that was given us earlier. But we're going to see that this this message is this whole structure. So when we get into September of 2019, Jeff reintroduces July 18th that was presented back in November of 2018. He reintroduces this into the movement. And we now have a whole bunch more light regarding July 18th that's going to unfold. The 777 structure, um, December uh, 20, uh, December 25th, 2021. All of these different things were meant to uh, correct this movement. They were instruments of God to correct us because we were worldly. We had worldly principles operating within the movement within ourselves. 
that we had to be corrected from. And, and that's the thing is that people never saw this about July 18th. They saw this as a type of vindication of basically our characters. And if God would have honored that prediction, um, that would have been, as Daniel Fontenot said, sanctioning sin. All right. So if if that prediction had occurred like we had had thought it would, we felt that we would have been vindicated. But the the fact is, God couldn't vindicate sin. Right. So so we can see that that something happened in 2019 in relationship to this message. That is God's correction. That is, he is, in a sense, uh, going to deliver us uh, because he's delivered us from these enemies in the past. But he's going to allow us to go through this experience here, uh, this oppression and, and the experience of this message, the message of Jephthah, uh, to correct us. So, so we had gone through this before. So we're not we're not really saying anything new, but we're just reminding ourselves of the things that we had studied. <clears throat> now, the story of Jephthah. Now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. He was the son of an harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. And Jeth, Jeth, Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah. And said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men in Jephthah and went out with him. It came to pass in process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. So the way that we looked at this before is this had to do again with the message of July 18th, right? That was rejected as illegitimate, but they're going to call upon this message at this time. Is that how we understood it? I mean, there was a lot, lot of detail we went into before. And, and here in the King James, when he's dwelt, uh, out of the land of Tob, they went to fetch him out of the land of Tob. Uh, in Hebrew, we normally pronounce this as Tov, uh, because the bet at the end is pronounced as a V sound. And it means good, right? So, so he's fetched out of the land of good. So what does all this mean here? When we went through this before, we have this... Uh, son of a harlot. Right. So, so Gilead, he has wives, but there is this son of a harlot. And why is that? And, and he's going to be thrust out because he's not the, a legitimate son. How did we understand this before when we looked at this? Now, how did we look at the 111? Was it uh, connected to the outcasts of Israel? Okay. Um, explain. What you mean? Well, we have um, is it Isaiah talks about the outcasts of Israel mm -hmm. are uh, going to be the ones that uh, give the entire message. Right. So, so we know that God always chooses the the weak things of the world uh, to confound the wise, right? So in contrast to the worldliness 
that this movement has had. We're going to have a message that is going to speak against that. So just just the simple thing from my observations is that um, one of the reasons the July 18th, 2020 prediction was rejected in the first place and why it received such, uh, I guess, a cold shoulder, even, even after the movement had accepted it, had to do with the very simple fact that this message was not something that was seen as exalting the movement. It was seen as a danger, right? We didn't want to be seen as time setters. We were worried about the optics of it. Would we agree with that? So the message was thrust out. And in other words, the message was not respected. It was decided that this is the kind of message that should not have been offered or given. Right. And right. So people didn't want the message of July 18th back in November of 2018. Definitely lots of resistance. I mean, Jeff accepted it. But, you know, he even had to set it aside because of the pressure that he was under for accepting it. And, and you know, the Thanksgiving Day prediction and all these different things were represented to him in such a way. Um, and, and Jeff always had this sort of um, voice being spoken to him from other people. Basically, don't listen to Theodore. Um, you know, he's nothing but trouble. And, and Jeff knew this. But and at one point he said, you know, now I see why people were opposed to Theodore, because now we have this message and he could see why they were opposed to it. And but he didn't see it as a good thing. But nonetheless, he still ended up setting it aside until such a time that we had um, this rebellion in 2019. Right. So now he's going to take back this message. But. We can see why it was rejected, and we can see why this, this deliverer that's going to deliver Israel is this one that was rejected. And so that happens in this movement because it's, it's appealing um, to a side of us that, that isn't worldly. That is, the July 18, 2020 prediction isn't, isn't really beneficial from a human perspective. You know, to make a prediction in time with as a Seventh-day Adventist, there is no time, right? People wanted after after Parminder had left, there was a lot of people in the movement who still uh, didn't want to accept time and didn't join in the July 18, 2020 prediction. So many people, once Parminder was gone, there's all these people who wanted to come back to follow Jeff again. Uh, but then Jeff took up this time setting. So, so we can see just from the, its initial rejection, it's, it's rejected for a purpose, that a reason behind its rejection has to do with the worldliness that exists in this movement. I don't know if, if I'm explaining it well or people can see it clearly, but for me it was clear that there's the principles of Christ um, on how things are to be done. We follow wherever God leads, whatever light he gives us. We don't try to assess that light based on what people are going to think, you know, we're time setters and we're going to lose our influence with friends and so forth. But that's that's what was happening. And so there was always this resistance to it. But the wealth, the evidence was so overwhelming for those who continued in the movement that um, they had to go along with the the proclamation of July 18th and the warning given to Nashville. But they still weren't convinced as we saw later on because they, they really had never accepted the message truly.
Okay, so so we have this this outcast, and he Gilead has wife wives bear him sons. So a wife, if if we're gonna say who Gilead represents and what his wife represents, um, we we didn't really I don't think with dealt with this too much. So we know that this is the land of Gilead. Of course, we already talked about that. That's in the territory where Manasseh is. So what is Gilead's wife that bear him sons? Is a wife a church? I think that'd be the logical way for us to look at that. Well, so, so Gilead's wife is what church? Would it not be the corporate church? Okay. And so how would we show that? Well, the offspring rejecting anything to do with Jephthah would mean that they believe that they, they have a true message and that Jephthah does not have a true message. Right. And, and so this message is a message that really comes from the church. Right. And, and, and there's a lot of things about Adventism that's correct, but there's lots of preconceptions that Adventists have, beliefs that we've inherited from the church. And those things have really hindered this movement all along. I mean, just basically what I would say as somebody who became an Adventist, and I know I talk about this, but I, I never really considered many Adventists to be converted or to be Christians, not that I can judge other people's hearts, but I would, I would just see that Adventists don't seem to have a sense of, of the principles of the gospel. And, and, and it's kind of hard to explain it, but I mean, it's just so worldly. The Adventist church was so worldly when I came into it. Um, and I came out of the world. So, I come out of the world and I come into this church that, that that's not really anything like Christ, but you still look for the good in it, right? I mean, there were good people here and there, um, but the way that they were operating was not the way that Christ would operate. And, and so we see that as people in this movement, especially the ones that were Seventh-day Adventists, they thought like Seventh-day Adventists, and, and Seventh-day Adventists are also tend to be critical of others. They see themselves as good. And um, so anything that's going to threaten them, a message that's going to threaten their security or their sense of who they are, uh, they're not going to accept that message. Adventists are not very open-minded to things that are going to reveal to them uh, their sins. And, and Jephthah um, means he will open, right? So this is, this is a message that's going to open our eyes. Is this part of that eye salve that we can see our sins? Is it would that almost have to be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so this this is this is what this message of July 18th has done for us if we've allowed it to. It's allowed us to see how unchristlike we are, how worldly we are, how unprepared we are. And and it's it's bringing a conviction to us that God could not have brought any other way. We in a sense needed to be humiliated if we want to look at it that way, um, in order for us to see the problems that are at the root 
of our characters. And, and, and often what we have as Seventh-day Adventists is this self-exalting uh, attitude. Other people are wrong. We hear it all the time about how other people don't understand truth, how other people don't see the truth, and we know the truth. And, and that's why, you know, conspiracy theories feed into that idea that I'm in the know and um, I'm better than other people because I know whatever it is. And I mean, it can be even true things, but definitely false things are one thing that can exalt the human heart above what it should be because we don't know anything there's all kinds of things happening in this world that we know nothing about and and our trust should be in god in his word what he has plainly revealed but people will jump on speculative theories because it flatters the ego and adventists want their ego flat ego flattered and we do right we're seventh-day adventists so we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But we need this ISAB that we can actually see our true spiritual condition. And God gives this message, a prophetic message, to help us see this condition that we are in, people in this movement. <clears throat> so he, he, Jephthah flees from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tov. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. Now, when we deal with these vain men, remember, these are light men. We saw something similar uh, when it came to um, uh, Gaal, or was it Abimelech? Abimelech, right? Abimelech had these, these men that he hired to kill the 70 sons. So, so Jephthah, he has these vain men. Is, is this the similar type of situation? Why, why are these empty, is the word that's worthless, fellows that gather around Jephthah? Okay. Yep. As, as you're looking at this, if we were to truly compare Scripture with Scripture, yep. you would, of course, have Judges 9.4, which you're referring to. Yeah, and it's using a different Hebrew word, is it not? Or is it? No, okay. It's the same word. Never mind. There's okay. vain and light persons. I was thinking of the word light. Um, but the vain one is the same. So vain means empty. And the, those were vain and light persons. These ones here are just vain persons. Right. Yeah. But we also would have 1 Samuel 22, 2. Okay, so 1 Samuel 22, 2. Oops. And everyone so, that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So this is going to be with David. Right. Yeah. So you have two comparatives. Abimelech was not one that was interested in following God, David was a man after God's own heart. And in 1 Samuel 22, 2, is this, I mean, this is in, re in relation to the issue that, that had come up with Saul, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so three times, we're looking at this. We're given the examples of one who is cast out because Abimelech was the son of a strange woman. Mm -hmm. Jephthah was the son of a woman and harlot. Mm -hmm. And then you have David. So why... I mean, I, are, we, are we being shown a progression here? Are we being shown that this message has a progression that it, it, it needs to follow? Okay. Well, so one of the things that, well, I don't know about that. 
But when we look at the story of, a, of Abimelech, right? So the story of Abimelech is, is this message that is, uh, it's actually a message of darkness, right? It's, right. It's an increase of darkness. So this is sort of an anti-message. This is a, a reversal of these other ones, right? So I, I don't know if it's a progression, um, but Judges 11.1 1, so one of the things I would look at here is I look at, at January 11th uh, as part of Jeff's structure, right? So remember, Jeff had the structure that went, well, it went back all the way to, to June 9th, 2018 to, I mean, it, it even went further. It went to March uh, 27th, 2021. But, but that initial part of that chiasm itself was these 63 days that make 126 days at the beginning and the 63 days, the two periods of 63 days that went from September 7th to, um, let me see, yeah, September 7th uh, to uh, January 11th, right? So September 7th, 2019 to January 11th, 2020. And then there was the 63 weeks that went to March 27th, 2021. But, but anyway, um, the symbol here is this message of Jephthah. This is um, connected to this understanding of July 18th. And would we say that vain men, empty men, gathered around this message? I mean, that's, I mean, to me, that would be the first thing I would look at. It's possible that we could say that, yeah. So, so just because there is a, a message that's an outcast, and you know that's this, this Jeff has rejected, there are people that are going to attach this message of July 18th, who attach for the wrong reasons, right? I mean, even with David, all those men who gather around him, they're not necessarily good men, but they're, you know. Maybe some are, some aren't. But discontented people um, aren't necessarily always good. When you have a, you know, a group of people that are discontented and they go and form a, a ministry, often they're discontented because there's problems with inside of themselves. But we're also looking at this as a symbol. So um, as a symbol, this is the message of Jephthah. Jephthah is a message. Um, but these empty men, this would be um, also messages that are going to be, in a sense, supporting July 18th. So not everything of that that came with July 18th was necessarily correct. There was lots of things about how the message was being uh, examined or understood. Um, that uh, um, I would not have presented, which which I thought was sort of a bit of a problem, but I could I couldn't really do what anything about what other people were presenting. I thought these things sort of took took away from the message. Okay, uh, yeah. So we referred to Isaiah sixty six verse five here and dealing with uh, the land itself, the land of Tov being a pleasant land or a good land. Um, so Isaiah 66, 5 says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified but he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. Now, um, any thoughts about this verse? I mean, there, there are those that are cast out. So those that tremble at God's word, they are often hated and cast out. 
And, and the ones that cast them out say, let the Lord be glorified. But it says, he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. Now, what's one of the things about this, um, this verse here, Isaiah 66, 5? What, what do we connect this to? What about Isaiah 66, 6? A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice from the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. So what is this talking about? How would we connect this 665 and this 666 and this message? Ezekiel chapter 8. Anybody? So you're connecting... Isaiah 665 and 666 with the abominations in the church. Okay, so we know that um, that's on the sixth year, the sixth month, and the fifth day of the month. But we know it's going to end, that vision on the sixth year, the sixth month, the sixth day of the month, right? Okay. And it's a message uh, against the, the church, but against the temple as well, because we know the temple is going to be destroyed 666 years uh, after the captivity of Jehoiachin. And that Ezekiel counts the years of the captivity. And the temple is destroyed in 70 AD in the 666th year of the captivity of, of Jehoiachin, right? And Jehoiachin was captive for 36 years, which is uh, a symbol of 666. And the temple is destroyed 36 years after the close of probation for the Jews, right? So we have that structure of the 666. But this 665 is, is connected to the Sunday law. Now, the voice of the noise from the city. So what would be the voice from of noise from the city? What would that be describing? The noise from the city. Is that not the destruction of the city? says here uproar by implication destruction so is the city going to be destroyed yes and a voice from the temple is the temple going to be destroyed well if the city is destroyed when the temple go with it yeah and a voice of the lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies so um here we have this this message so we know that the enemies of course destroy the temple, but really the enemies are the cause of the destruction of the temple, whether internal or external. Now, the Sunday law that comes, is it being typified by the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes. So we know that clearly from the spirit of prophecy. And, and so here, when we deal with this message of Jephthah, does it address the Sunday law? Does it address um, this history? I mean, one is we know that the July 18, 2020 prediction was based upon Ezekiel. So this, this message that's outcast, the reason it's cast out is because it's a message from God talking about the destruction of, of the city and the temple, correct? Agreed. Yeah. And we don't connect ourselves 
to, we think because we've left the church, that somehow we're immune from this destruction. But we actually have the same spirit in us that exists within the church. Right? We, we will talk about the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist church is going to support the Sunday law. Right? But wouldn't we also support the Sunday law when it comes down to it since we're operating on the same principles as the church? That we would crucify Christ even though we say well, we would never crucify him. The Jews did that. So this rejection, this casting out of this message, is because this message speaks against our nature. Now, vain men attach themselves to this message. Why do they do that? Because I don't think these vain men are good. Why do people attach themselves to a message that is true? To appear that they're on the right side of the issues? I don't know. Well, yeah. So we often think that the profession of truth is the same as obedience, correct? Agreed. We can, we can see that something is true, and so if we just support it with our words, with, with you know, some of our actions, that somehow that will, um, that will deal with the problems that exist within us that we never want to de deal with. And this has been the problem always with those that are presenting truth is that, you know, the Israelites, when they leave Egypt, who goes with them? We have the mixed multitude, don't we? Correct. People are always trying to attach themselves to the truth, even when they often don't understand it. as if that will somehow save them. But God says that we have to be obedient. We have to be converted. We have to be changed. And this message is meant to do that. Now, some of the people who are vain may end up being saved. And, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily talking about people, but it is a message and there definitely was messages that connected with the July 18th message that I would call vain or empty. Many people were writing me with all kinds of predictions. Jeff was getting all kinds of things sent to him. People were trying to, um, and, and this was a problem too, because, you know, I was somehow grouped in with that. You know, so when I would do something, well, even when we did the November 22nd, 2018 prediction, the Thanksgiving Day prediction, it was seen as if this was somehow me trying to get attention. But there are lots of people like that trying to get attention. Um, and so superficially, you know, people can think that they're promote, they're supporting a message. I, you'd be amazed at how, how many people would want to be heard about something regarding July 18th that was just completely wrong. Now, I still always listen to everyone. So everyone that wrote me, I would you know, listen to what they had to say, try to evaluate it, try to explain um, why I thought it was not correct, where they were going wrong. But I was still willing to listen to it. I wasn't going to dismiss it just because it came from uh, some source or had some things even, even in it that were wrong. But but this is what has happened, right, with the message of July 18th. It, it brought a lot of baggage along with it that came from other sources. And so for some people, it was hard to really distinguish what was true. But anyway, uh, when we get to Judges 11.4, right, it says, it came in process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. 
And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. So why are they going to do that? Why, why would they fetch Jephthah? I mean, he's just, I mean, how is he special in any way? If Jephthah is a message, if Jephthah represents a message, then is Jephthah's message being recognized as being correct? Yeah, so there's some, it doesn't really tell us too much about it. I mean, they believe that Jephthah is going to be the one that should lead them, right? So that would mean, you know, not understand it, all the details of their situation. But that would mean if we accepted, if we called July 18th to come and, and to fight against the children of Ammon, that is, there must have been a rejection, there must have been a, a recognition that July 18th was correct, even when people cast it out. Okay, but who is it that is going to, looking to fetch Jephthah? Um, well, the, this is going to be the children of Israel. I mean, I don't know who specifically. The elders of Gilead. Okay. So, yeah. Why is it important that the elders of Gilead are going to look to fetch Jephthah from the land of Tov? Well, these would be the leaders. Okay, but. You, you identified Tov as what? Well, Tov means good. Okay. So Jephthah is thrust out. He goes to a good land. Yeah. And aren't the type of studies that we have been doing since July 18th a good land? Yeah. Well, even before July 18th. But because I'm saying that Jephthah is called, you know, in September of... Uh, 2019 okay right. but it's the elders of gilead that look to fetch jephthah yeah why is it important that it is the elders of gilead that are noted i don't know i mean it's the leadership okay but what leadership well it's the elders I mean, and, th and that's the thing is because we have Gilead. So so there is, remember, um, there is a person named Gilead, right? He has a wife, and that wife is the church, right? So Gilead does not represent the church, but he has a wife that is the church. Okay. Um and he's he's now just so Jeff says a Gileadite, but we have he this Gilead is from Gilead, right? Okay, now I'm I'm gonna throw a concept at you. Okay. And we'll find this concept in Review and Herald, October twenty second, nineteen oh one. Okay, so we got it in October twenty second. Yeah. And that's Review and Herald, so I have to go there. And it, it's what year? 1901. 1901, okay. A couple of big symbols there. Okay, it's the voice of faithful rebuke. Read the first paragraph. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Okay, so here's Elijah the Tishbite, who is of the inhabitants of Gilead. So, is it a con? Is this concept that Jephthah being a message? 
is the message of July 18th and that the elders of Gilead are those that would then look to give the Elijah message. Well, they should have given the Elijah message. Yes, but yeah. they didn't. Yeah. But the the overall concept is that once they begin to recognize the validity of the July 18th message, then they begin to proclaim it. And as an elder of Gilead, are they not then giving a message in the same spirit and power of Elijah? Mm -hmm. Because then you're dealing with Elijah as the symbol of those that would be translated without seeing death. So we're talking about the 144,000. Yeah. No, and this movement, um, I mean, so I would say the elders of Gilead represent this movement. Okay. Because um, this movement is the one that's going to call the Jephthah, right? But but they they do this um, incorrectly. So um, so one of the things is it says they come and be our captain that we may fight with the children of Ammon. So what what is the problem with the way that that the July eighteenth message is received when? Um, uh, when we have this situation after Parminder's departure, because we're going to we're going to accept July 18th as a movement, but there are some problems with that that we can see here in Judges chapter 11. Because the message of Jephthah doesn't want to be the captain. No, it doesn't. Okay. So what does it mean for the, the elders of Gilead to ask Jephthah to be their captain? What's, what's the problem with that? Aren't they basically saying we want you to take the responsibility for what's got to be done? Yeah, but there still is a problem, a worldly principle involved. Okay. That is, we want to operate like the world. The, the reason July 18th was finally accepted is, I mean, it, it's rather complicated, but part of it had to do with self-justification in the movement to what happened with Parminder. So Parminder was opposed to the July 18 message too, right? Correct. And, and by accepting the message, the way that it was presented is here's something that Parminder rejected and we don't like Parminder. So let's examine it. I mean, that was my perspective of it. Um, So I don't think that the message was accepted by understanding. That is, there wasn't there wasn't the conviction. People didn't study July 18th and and understand it. I mean, even when they were, uh, you know, publishing the the article in the Tennessee and 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 before that, I mean, they're not having me present anything about July 18th. Um, you know, to the movement. And, you know, we had, um, you know, some questions being brought, you know, how do we justify this or justify that without an understanding of, of July 18th hardly at all? I mean, Jeff understood it, but Jeff didn't understand it fully, right? None of us really do. Uh, 
but there was definitely lots of insights. If the movement had studied July 18th together properly, um, we would have we would have been able to sort through it. But of course, we didn't. Right. So ifs are big things. Um, but, you know, the one thing is I saw that it was a failed prediction. It was on a line of failed predictions, whether it would fail or not. I wasn't certain, but I thought it's something that we needed to examine. And the movement wasn't willing to examine that. So the movement was looking for a message that would just put us back on top, so to speak, if that makes sense to people. Parminder had left. We, we were licking our wounds to some degree. And here seemed to be something that could deliver the movement. But it was actually something that was really meant to deliver us from ourselves. And that was not anything that anybody wanted. So Jeff has said unto the elders of Gilead, did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now when ye are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore, we turn again to thee now that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head. So here they before had said, Captain. Right? Right. It's a different word than head. So, and the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, the Lord be witness between us if we do not so according to thy words. Um, so in other words, when, when you're looking, stepping back to Judges 11.7. Oh, yeah, I, I kind of skipped something there. Okay, yeah, Judges 11.7, yeah. Did ye not hate me and expel me out of my father's house? Yeah. So the message of July 18th was hated and by the decisions of the committee that were handed down on December 6th. Yeah. The message was expelled out of the quote house of the movement or the father's house. Yeah, though I, d I put the ex the expelling of the message back in 2018. Okay. And the acceptance of the message in 2019. Okay, but then the question is, why are you come unto me now when you are in distress? Right, so they're going to be in distress. That's after Parminder leaves. Okay. Right. And so then they say um, in verse 8, to be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And then Jephthah says unto the elders of Gilead, if ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, the Lord be witness between us if we do not so according to thy words. And Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon saying, what hast thou to do with me that thou art come against me to fight in my land and the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah because Israel took away my land so we're going to go into this tomorrow uh, in more detail no we'll go into it on Sunday on Sunday yes so um, but this whole thing we went through it before um, but I think now we have a bit more insight of what this is about now that we have started drawing these things on a line. So we should be able to take this story of Judges 11 and um, and then 12. So it's 11 and 12. So we have 10, 11, and 12 that's really dealing with this whole story of Jephthah. Um, and um, this whole situation with the Ephraimites, all those things, and then we're going to have chapter 12 is going to have some more things. Um, but it, it's it, we're going to see how it fits in to this history 
of July 18th up to 2023. So again, we're going to be brought through that history all the way from 2001, all the way to 2023. And the way that the message is treated, now we know people are connected with messages, but it's really how the message is treated um, that we're going to look at in what it accomplishes and um, how this addresses the problems that exist within the movement presently. Okay, so any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the time that we have had to study your word and uh, be with us uh, throughout this day. Um, bless each person. Help us as we continue to study on our own. We pray for the study uh, tomorrow evening and on Sabbath, uh, the study in the morning. And we just ask, Lord, that you can help us to understand truth. Help us and guide us in the decisions that we need to make and the actions we need to take. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.